Good morning, good morning, good morning. So, why here? Why now? Ever wonder about that? Why are you here? Why are you here now? Was it only because of your parents? Obviously, most of us forget who we were before we came here, and we forget why we're here, even while we're living it out. Interestingly enough, modern studies repeatedly suggest that a significant portion of people in the Western world now believe in reincarnation. Notice I said the Western world. Now, funny thing how that is. The Western world has an idea that it knows more about the world than anyone else. Only to find out that what it is now discovering has been known by the rest of the world for thousands of years. <laughs> but there's a shift now. There's a shift that's taking place. And the shift is... <sighs> It's changing in that, especially, more intellectually minded spiritual seekers are tending toward the view that anything outside of the one is mere illusion. Hmm. And there's two illusion models that they give. If we only reincarnate for as long as we fail to see through the illusion, and that as soon as we do, at, by gaining enlightenment, that we'll break the bonds of karma and reunite with Source. Heard anything like that? Okay, so we've heard that one. Okay, and then the other one, a little more radical, but that any, any individuality, is completely illusory on all levels. And that as soon as we die, there is no sense of continuation of any sort of individual soul consciousness. We all go back to whatever it is and lose our sense of self. I don't think animals even experience that entirely. But anyhow, these are the two illusion models. And interestingly enough, they're supported by a significant portion of our best known spiritual commentators of modern times. Power of now, cosmic ordering, quantum mysticism. Okay, let's stop for a moment here, okay? Why are we here now? There's another model. But it's called the experience model. And it holds that we lead many lives in order to see all the sides of every emotional coin and to learn to deal with the manifest challenges that life on this planet provides. The emphasis is on individual soul growth by experience over many lifetimes. Now, while it may seem like these two are at odds with each other, it's really not. It's just a matter of our opening our perceptions to where, one, we get away from the deadhead approach that this is just one life, and then afterwards you either go to heaven or to hell, and then the opening of the expansiveness of that to realize a lot of people remember things about being here before. And that there are books written on the subject, as well as consider who we are here right now. You may think, well, gee, I live over here and I come here or I... I came from out of state, or whatever it may be. What if it's other than that? 
Of course, one of my favorite subject work has to deal with near-death experiences. And if you've had one, then you know it can be a really <laughs> exciting experience. And it can reveal a number of things to you and change your perspective about life in very definite ways. Now, here's a fascinating case. There was a German, rather, excuse me, a Russian scientist. His name was George Rodonaya. Anyhow, he worked with chemical brain transmitters in Russia and was valued by the KBG, KGB rather, and he got this invitation to come to the United States to further his studies at Yale. So he's got everything packed, he's standing out on the sidewalk, he's waiting for the taxi to pick him up and take him to the train station, and he is mowed over by a car and killed, <laughs> deliberately. KGB, maybe? But he is in the morgue for three days, his body. When they began to perform the autopsy, all of a sudden his eyelids start flickering, everybody jumps back three days, and they began to change the procedure. <laughs> Obviously, the KGB wasn't in there at that time. <laughs> so anyhow, fascinating what he comes back with. This guy had no religious understanding whatsoever. But he comes back, and he begins to express all the different things that he's experienced in these three days. And it comes down to the morgue was right next door to the hospital. He was able to get up and move about and travel astrally. One of the people that he encountered was a little baby who was just crying incessantly in the hospital. He discovered that he could actually communicate with her telepathically. And he did, only to find out that her crying was because she had a broken hip. He scanned her body and was able to see. Yeah, sure enough, she had a broken hip. So as soon as he was able to communicate this to the doctors, they then took the little girl in, did an x-ray on her, and found out, sure enough, she had a broken hip. And it was probably, it probably happened at birth. Pretty fascinating, isn't it? Okay, so just to give you an idea that we can and do, and there are those who have the capacity to remember what we can and what we do. This one happened to come across quite well. Now, what about spontaneous memories of past lives? This gets really exciting and really interesting. Okay, here's a story. This fellow was born in 1998. His name was James Linegar, and he was born in Lafayette, Louisiana. Okay. And he had a fascination with toy airplanes, which turned a little sinister about age two when he started having these really vivid, horrific nightmares. And in his dreaming, he would scream out. And he would say things like, airplane on fire, crashing, little man can't get out. Well, neither of his parents had any connection whatsoever with reincarnation, but the mother's mother said, you know, there might be something to this, honey. Why don't you start asking him some questions? So she said, okay, I will. So she did. She started asking him questions, which prompted him to start coming out with these amazing details that a two-year-old would not be expected to have. Okay, so some of his details were such as his name was James when he was in the airplane, when he flew. He flew in the Second World War in the Japanese theater, and the Japanese were the ones who shot him down. He said he flew Corsairs. He said there was another pilot there that he knew, and his name was Jack Larson. And then he also mentioned this mysterious world called Matoma which his parents couldn't understand at all. But this piqued his father's curiosity to where his father started doing some research, went to the library, started going and 
checking on different things in different places, and came up with the facts that he had been stationed in the Pacific in World War II, and that the notorious Battle of Iwo Jima was the battle in which the USS Natoma Bay aircraft carrier was a part of that war. So he ordered a book and was flicking through it and just looking at different things. And the little boy was there and said, they po he pointed to an island that was next to Iwo Jima that was called Chichijima. And he said, Daddy, that's where my plane was shot down. So the father goes into, there's there are like archives of the Natoma Bay Association where different people, you know, they'll contribute things and make them available. Went on to find out that yes, it was confirmed that there was another pilot there by the name of Jack Larson, and that the only one pilot had been lost at Chichijima, and the name of that pilot was 21-year-old Lieutenant James M. Houston, Jr. That's not the clincher, though. Here's the clincher. The little boy had three G.I. Joe dolls that he named Leon, Walter, and Billy. His dad said, why do you call them that? He said, because they greeted me when I went to heaven. So again, military records confirm that the three of Houston's fellow Natoma Bay pilots were Lieutenant Leon Connor, Ensign Walter Devlin, and Ensign Billy Peeler. And that all three had died before Houston on other engagements. Pretty fascinating, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Really. So this, this fellow has gone on and written several books, if any of you are interested in following up. Okay? So do I have your attention? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why? Here. Why? Now. So let's look a little into this with past life and hypnotic regression. And there have been so many cases of hypnotic regressions where evidential experiences have been recorded time after time after time, so I'm not going into that. But one thing that I did want to bring out with regard to many of these uh, hypnotic regressions, past life regressions, that has come up repeatedly so much by different independent uh, individuals that there has been a five element play that is recorded as the inter-life sequence. The first is transition. We call it croaking, dying, and healing. So we all go through this. Then there's a past life review. And many, many people have, with near-death experiences, come back and express this about the past life review. And then soul group interaction over there. Soul group interaction. Keep that in mind so far as who we are here now. And then next life planning. And of course, returning. Here we are. That we've all gone through this individually and as groups together because there are similarities in what we are choosing to experience, have experienced, need to experience, and come back together. Why here? Why now? Look at this that's happening right here on planet Earth, right now. You know that there have to be other groups, soul groups, who have incarnated and are working out, living out, experiencing different segments of the overall grand scheme of things, just as we are. And this is bringing to mind something that a lot of people forget, and it has to do with the fact that we're all a part of the whole. We're part of source. But we are individualized. We are individuated. You might could say that this is making reference to the principle of the hologram. Because a hologram is that the part contains the whole and yet is clearly distinguish distinguishable from it. This is to help you to get a better feel 
of who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. Because the importance of this can be brought forward with this type of explanation. It isn't by chance that this happens, and it isn't by the dictates of some law such as karma. Free will and personal responsibility reign supreme. That's so important, I'm saying it again. Free will and personal responsibility reign supreme. This is what allows us to learn from our mistakes and to grow. So, next life previews, I'm looking to see what I'm going to do in my next life, is seen between lives merely resents major probabilities and some minor possibilities. And that there really is no karmic punishment or predestiny. It puts all of it right back where it belongs, and that's with us. We have the free will to make the choices how we're going to live our lives, and we're personally responsible for those choices that we make, and we experience the results of them. What we sow, we reap. But it is all based upon our continuing learning, our continued growing. It is the clear from this that the dynamics of how our attitudes and intentions and experiences feed into the futures we create for ourselves. So why here, why now? You might could say, we earned it. It's our privilege. It's our wonderful opportunity to be involved in this tremendous upheaval that's taking place on planet Earth where the old, dense, distorted awareness of life is breaking up and is being replaced by higher frequency awarenesses. This is something that we learn by doing. It isn't something that is given to us and it's an automatic. It's something that every one of us learns individually and we get our own take on it that then collectively adds to a growing awakening within the whole human population. <coughs> I could say from this that there are no flaws in the grand plan. The physical world is not an abomination created by fallen angels. Nor is a reincarnation something cycle something to be escaped from at all costs. We do well to aim for a degree of emotional detachment and balance. I think we all come to that conclusion, especially when we get all amped up and get lost, and then find that in order to get found, we have to settle down, refocus, get clear, get detached, and become present. Source's primary aim, you might say in all of this, is to, through you, through me, through all of us, through each and every one of us, to experience all that is and all that can be. So if you look at it from this perspective, it kind of helps you have a better appreciation for every one of us who's involved in this right here on planet Earth. The ones that we call the good guys, and the ones that we call the bad guys. Collectively, we're all learning from our experiences and coming up with a collective frame of reference that becomes enhanced as we choose to lift ourselves by raising our rate of vibration and begin to practice living higher vibrational experiences. So take this into account, that when you find yourself stumbling over something that you feel you should have already learned, give yourself a break. Cut yourself some slack. You're really doing quite well. And you don't have to worry about some god who's looking at you and saying you're a failure. 
and that you're going to be punished by going to hell and suffering there forever. <laughs> we get away from that nonsense. We step free of that idiotic consideration. So why here? Why now? It's because you are who you are and who you are becoming. Thank you. For more information about the Metaphysical Church of Enlightenment or the Rodin Foundation, please go to our website at www.rodin.org. If you have been inspired by the revelations shared in these podcasts, please donate to the Rodan Foundation's ongoing efforts to help others help themselves at www.rodan.org slash donate.